Welcome back, lecture 48. Uh, I think today is day 58, actually, of a 71-day semester. So we are rounding the corner, looking at the finish line. Uh, before we go into new material, it was brought to my attention that I had a mistake on the last problem we went through in class. Probably multiple mistakes. This is the only one that was actually brought to my attention. So let's go back to that problem, and um, you'll see that if my brain was fully engaged, um, as opposed to about a third engaged, uh, we wouldn't have made that mistake. Actually, we, I, wouldn't have made that mistake. So we did, I think this was the last problem we did, last class. We were um, trying to find the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence. So here was the original problem. Uh, this was actually written later. We were trying to determine that it was centered around negative 2 because that was our x minus a. It was actually x minus negative 2. Uh, we used the ratio test. This is not the mistake. In fact, on this page is not the mistake. But this is what we did. Uh, we got this value for our limit. One-third absolute value of x plus 2. Uh, we made sure that was less than 1 in order for this thing to converge because that's what we're looking for, interval of convergence, radi radius of convergence. So just convert this absolute value inequality into this algebraic statement, and we got our interval to be kind of initially from negative 5 to 1, it was centered at negative 2, and the radius of convergence was 3. We still had a little more work to do, and that is to check the endpoints, and that last one is where my error occurred. So we checked out x equals negative 5 by putting negative 5 in for x. Uh, we got negative 3 to the n, which is negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n, left a 3 in the denominator. So we decided that was an alternating series. We thought it looked like it was in trouble. And in fact, it did not pass the first test of the alternating series test. So that one's OK. Actually, the conclusion here is OK, but how we got there is not OK. So this is where the error occurred. Um, I apologize for that. x equals 1. So we put in 1 for x. 1 plus 2 is 3 to the n. So we end up with n over 3. Um, this is where I apparently was not fully engaged mentally, because n over 3, as n approaches infinity, is not 1 third. Okay, so if you were thinking that, go ahead and stop me in that erroneous train of thought that I'm on. And uh, n over 3, as n approaches infinity, clearly is not 0, but it's not 1 third. As n gets larger, the numerator gets larger, this thing gets infinitely large still the same conclusion. So no different answer, but it's not one-third. That would be infinitely large. Sorry for that. Thank you. I don't know who pointed that out. Ben, did you point that out to me? Thank you. Yes? You had negative 3 to the n, and you split it up negative 1 to the n, 3 to the n. When you multiply those together, wouldn't it be negative 3 to the 2n? No. Why? Um, because if you're gathering things together in that type of scenario where you have, um, let's say, 2 cubed times 5 cubed, is that the same thing as 2 times 5 cubed? You don't do anything to the exponent. You bring out that commonality. Everything's being multiplied, and these things are individual, individually being raised to the power, but you're not going to do anything to the power when you group them together. It's still so negative 1 to the n and 3 to the n is negative 1 times 3 to the n, or negative 3 to the n. So that... It's like x squared times x squared when you're combining. You're just combining. Well, never mind. I get it. Um, so x squared times x squared in this type of thing would be because you're really trying to factor out the thing being squared, it'd be x times x being squared. That's the same line of reasoning. And I think all those are correct. 
but if I do make mistakes, please correct me. I hate to especially leave it up there when it's the last thing we do. Um, sorry about that. All right. Uh, we will meet all four days this week. Friday is a uh, what they call spring holiday, uh, what we used to call Good Friday. But we will not meet that day, but we will meet all four of the, the normal days. So it will be a four-day week, but um, we need all the days to, this week to do what we need to do. All right, let's keep going. I think we get to the really good stuff. Um, still coming up in this chapter, but this is a good lead-in to Taylor and McLaurin series, um, which is coming up, and there's some pretty valuable stuff, pretty, I think, fun stuff in there. Functions as power series, and then we'll see what kinds of power series we can come up with, and what do the coefficients look like, how can we use the functions and higher order derivatives to get coefficients. That's later, but right now it's just kind of a power series approach. So we're going to have a function. Here's the first one. We'll kind of use this as a, not only as a model, but uh, also it resurrects things that we've already done in this chapter. So I think the first time we encountered this, we um, talked about it in terms of an infinite geometric series. And this is of the form A over 1 minus r, so if this were the sum of terms in an infinite geometric series, the first term would be 1, and the ratio would be x. x. So we multiply by x as we go, so we have this um, power series in x, it is infinite in nature. So if the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, then this thing converges, and in fact it converges to 1 over 1 minus x. So we can write that as uh, in sigma notation. In fact, any Of course, it depends where you start in, so let's actually do a couple of these. Um, so if we have the first term times the ratio to the n minus 1, I think that's the first way it's presented in the book. We don't really want the first term to have the ratio in it. We don't want it to be present in the first term. So if that's the case, then we would want to start this at 1. So the first term generated would have the ratio to the 1 minus 1 or to the 0, so it's technically not present. But we could write that as a r to the n as long as we started n at 0. And we've been doing some of that lately, so that's probably actually done more in the latter part of chapter 8 than it is in the earlier sections of chapter 8, is starting in at 0. I think it, in a lot of ways, makes more sense to start in at 1, then 1 generates your first term, 2 generates the second term, and so on. Well, if that's the case here, first term is 1 times the ratio, which is x, and if we use this format right here, where we're starting it at 0, then we would want to start in itself at 0. The first term doesn't have x in it. It's just 1. So if we just have x to the n, n starting at 0 and going to infinity, this is the expanded version, and this is what it would be as a function. So when it says a function as a power series, there's our function for this particular problem, our function of x. And that power series converges uh, if the absolute value of x is less than 1. So there's the interval of convergence, the radius of, con it's centered at x equals 0, and the radius of convergence is 1. 
So let's use that particular model where this thing in the numerator, when we're done with it, is going to represent the first term of our infinite geometric series. This thing that is being subtracted from 1 is going to be the ratio. And really, the only thing we have to do as we convert some other function into this form is we have to make sure that this term is 1. If it's not 1, we've got to do something to it to convert it to 1. Once we've got that term to be 1, it doesn't matter if we're adding something or subtracting something. We can figure out what the ratio is. It doesn't really matter what's in the numerator because that's indicative of the first term. So let's say our function is 1 over 1 plus x cubed. And the directions are to write it as a power series. So the first thing we have to do is, if that is not 1, is to make it 1, as long as it's what we do is legal. Uh, it is 1, so we're in business. Uh, we can convert that. In fact, in this problem, that's probably the next thing. And any time you have addition, that's convertible to subtraction by subtracting a negative. So is it hot in here? Yes. Let's see if we can prop the door open and get a little bit of outside air moving. It may be one of those days where we're kind of transitioning from hot to cold and we don't have any air running. Of course, just wait a couple hours, right? It's supposed to be 30 degrees tonight. That's what I heard. Wonderful weather this time of year. Go out and breathe all that yellow green pollen. Isn't that just wonderful? See it rolling down the street in the rain. All right, so the first term, once we have it converted into this form, this thing is the first term. So our first term is 1. It looks like our ratio is negative x cubed. So if we were to write out the expanded form, it's kind of hard to say what kind of answer we're expected to give. Uh, when it just says write it as a power series, so we could, let's do both. Let's write it in expanded form. Let's also write it in the closed form, the sigma notation. So if we were writing it out, the first term is 1. The ratio is negative x cubed. So what's the next term? 1 times negative x cubed. Multiply by negative x cubed again. What's the next term? Okay. Multiply by negative x cubed. So it is alternating. In fact, we can kind of make it have that look of an alternating series. But there it is in expanded form. So that is this function as a power series. Uh, under what conditions would this particular power series be convergent? If the thing is ultimately 0. Go ahead and leave that open. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, we want the ratio, which is that in absolute value to be less than 1. So technically, I guess when x cubed is less than 1, and when would x cubed be less than 1? Okay, negative 1 to 1. So the same interval of convergence that we had when the ratio was just x. It's going to be the same one for this particular power series. Let's go ahead and write it using sigma notation. First term is 1. That don't, doesn't really need to be written. The ratio is negative x cubed. That works, doesn't it? See if when n is 0, we generate the first term. When n is 1, 
do we generate the second term when n is 2? That term seems to work. What are some other forms? So just in case you come up with an answer that maybe doesn't exactly match this. Okay. And we'll just leave that one out because it's kind of doesn't really serve much of a purpose. So that has the look of an alternating series. How about x cubed to the n? How else could that be written? Something raised to a power, itself raised to a power, x to the 3n. And let's say we want to start this thing at 1 instead of at 0. How do we do that? What about this n right here? n minus 1 or n plus 1? Some way we just need to make sure it doesn't start with a negative, right? It's got to start with a positive. So if you want to use n minus 1, that'll work. n plus 1 will also work. Just have to start it the way we want it to start. Start with a positive. How about the power of x? Right. We want an n minus 1 right there where there was an n. Let's test it. If n is 1, the first term is negative 1 to the 0, which is positive. x to the what? 0. So the first term is 1. Let's try n equals 2. Negative 1 to the 1, which is negative, which we want it to be negative. If n is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, x to the third, and that is what we want the second term to be. So that seems to work. So there's a lot of different versions of answers, even if yours doesn't match what you see in the back of the book, or uh, in case you're submitting an answer to WebAssign and it's not liking it, you've got some other choices that are 100% equivalent. Okay, let's find a power series. Got to work a little bit harder at this one. 2 over 3 plus x. Okay. So, again, kind of keeping in mind this is where we're headed. Eventually, what's left in the numerator is going to be a. What is subtracted from 1 is going to be the ratio. And, again, the key is getting a 1 in that position. And there are a lot of ways of accomplishing that. There are a lot of things we could factor a 2 out in front and just not have the 2 in the numerator, but I'm just going to leave that alone. So this 3 that's here, let's divide it by 3, but we can't divide that by 3 without dividing everything else in the numerator and denominator by 3. So that's almost there. What else? One minus negative. Okay. One minus negative x over three. So now we're ready to write it as a power series in expanded form if that's what's desired. First term is two thirds. Ratio is, okay, there's first term, there's the ratio, so what is the value of the next term of this power series? Two ninths. Two ninths. X. 
next term. Okay, we know it's going to be, with the ratio being negative, we know we're going to alternate signs. So we just need to multiply this by x over 3, right, and alternate the signs. So what do we get? 2x squared. And then we've got the pattern going, right? Alternate the signs, multiply the numerator by x and the denominator by 3, and we're in business. So if it's an expanded form, that'll work using sigma notation. First term is 2 thirds. Ratio is negative x over 3. Okay, we want to start it at 0. We can start our scrolled variable at 0. Negative x over 3 to the n. Let that thing run all the way to infinity. I guess that's not true all the time, but it's true for the values for which the power series converges. Where does this converge? X is the value of X is less than three. Does that work? So we want the ratio to be less than one. In absolute value, we can drop the negative sign, the absolute value of the negative. So we want that. So we want X over three smaller than one, greater than negative one. I think you said it. Multiply through by 3. A little larger interval of convergence, larger radius of convergence. Um, let's get some other versions here. Could I bring that 2 thirds out in front? Nothing variable in there. And we could separate out the alternating part, so negative 1 to the n. So that would work. And we could change the scrolled variable to have it start at n equals 1 and doctor that up a little bit, but that, that's enough, I think, for that one. All right, here's a function. First time we've had something that's not just a number in the numerator, x cubed. Again, here's where we're headed. a over 1 minus r. Did you think through what you would want to do? Divide by 4. <coughs> That'll probably do it, won't it? What's the first term? Nice, delightful what? X, X cubed over 4. Ratio is positive or negative X over 4. Okay, It's whatever is being subtracted from 1. So the first term, X cubed over 4. that work? Let's see what happens with this. We might get a variety of answers here. The first term is x cubed over 4, and the ratio is x over 4 to the n. Can anything there be brought out front? Okay, we could bring a one-fourth out front. 
Then we've got x cubed. Uh, that 4 gets raised to higher and higher power, so we better leave that one alone. So x over 4 to the n is x to the n over 4 to the n. Any advantage to writing it that way? Get x to the n plus 3. Okay. We can put our x's together. Here's x cubed. Here's x to the n. They have the same base. They're being multiplied. We can add the exponents. So x to the n plus 3 over 4 to the n. And let's check out a couple and see if that is, in fact, what we want. So at any, let's keep the 1 fourth out in front of everything. So at n equals 0, we've got n plus 3, which is 0 plus 3. x to the third over 4 to the 0, is that right? Is that what we want for the first term? I think that's right. At n equals 1, x to the 1 plus 3, x to the fourth over 4 to the 1. Does that seem to be right? Equivalent to what we wrote earlier. There's the first term. x to the 4th over 16 seems to be working right. What advantage is this form over our original form? It's a little bit simpler to substitute into, but it, to be honest with you, it's not enough different to make a big deal over. Instead of putting in your n value and adding 3 to every exponent, it's basically taken care of right there. Um, interval of convergence. Not convergent for all values. When is this convergent? Negative 4 and negative x is greater than negative 4 but less than 4. Okay, negative 4 to 4. Does that work? Because we would want the absolute value of x over 4 to be smaller than 1 in absolute value. You'll be able to, it's kind of hard to get pictures of this now, but as we move into later sections of Chapter 8, Taylor and McLaurin series, you'll be able to get a picture of what the interval of convergence is all about, what it looks like, and if you go beyond that interval of convergence, kind of what happens to the graph um, inside that interval and outside the interval. So we'll be able to get eventually a visual on that. All right, power series can be differentiated and can also be integrated. So let's make that the kind of the task here for the rest of the class, and we'll get in numerous examples of that. So let's start with some gen generic power series where we've got a just a number, c sub 0, as the first term, coefficient of the n equal 1 term will be c1. We'll either have an x or an x minus a. Generically, we can probably do better by saying so there's our power series. <coughs> So using sigma notation, it seems like each term has a C subscripted. So let's call it C sub n, and we're going to start n at 0 if that's the case, because our first term has a C sub 0. We're going to have powers of x minus a. And if we start, not that that's necessarily where we have to end, let's make sure it's right. If n is 0, does that start where we want this to start? 
when n is 0, we'd have x minus a to the 0, and we don't want an x minus a right here. When n is 1, we've got a c sub 1, x minus a to the 1. So it looks like the subscript and the power are in agreement, right? And we want that to happen. From our first line, let's take the derivative term by term. And we'll have also another way to do that, which is what this is this little section is all about. C sub zero is a number, its derivative is zero. What's the derivative of C sub one x minus a? C If we distributed this, we'd have c, t c sub 1 times x and c sub 1 times a. a is a number, so the derivative of c sub 1 times a would be 0. Derivative of c sub 1 x is c sub 1. Is that okay? What's derivative of the next term? 2c2x two two minus a. Derivative of the next term. 3x minus a squared. And isn't that pattern going to be the same the rest of the way? If that pattern is present the same way we had a similar pattern, but slightly different pattern, in the original function, here was our pattern for the original function. Let's see if we can write that pattern out using sigma notation. And is that pattern one that we can derive without using the expanded version? How could we write this? Well, we're going to have C sub something. X minus, X minus A to the Okay, you want to have an N here? Yes. Um, now that's not really present here, so we really don't pick that up till here, right? X minus A to the N minus 1. So we don't have the same type of agreement we had up here. The subscripted C and the power of X minus A were the same. Here the subscripted C and the power of x minus a are different. C sub 2, x minus a to the 1. C sub 3, x minus a to the 2. So it looks like it's 1 behind, so that seems to be true. And n, I guess we can kind of figure out where we want to start this. n equals 1. Is that correct? Is that going to work? If n is 1, and I don't, we'll need to justify that too, uh, why we think it needs to start at 1 when the original started at 0. Um, when n is 1, the first term ought to be 1, c sub 1, x minus a to the 0. Is that our first term in the derivative? It's correct, isn't it? When n is 2, we ought to have a 2, c sub 2, x minus a to the 2 minus 1. Is that the next term? Seems to be giving us what we want. So if that's our original function, and this seems to be working for the derivative, do we really have to do a term by term? The fourth term, because isn't that going to be 6c3 on the top one, but only 4c3 on the bottom one? All right, let's make sure. That's, good. That's a good thing to do. So if we did the derivative here, we would want 3 times 2 would be 6. Maybe we need to doctor that up a little bit. Where are we up here? 
the next term up here would be, sorry, wrong line. The next term up here would be C4, X minus A to the 4. We are, we're still okay, aren't we? Yeah, yeah you're, yeah. you're uh, I was thinking like you... you right, I, yeah. I was thinking maybe we needed factorial when you made that comment, but I think we're okay. Because we're not gathering any prior coefficients along the way, we've just got the 4 from the power. I think we're okay. So I'm going to write the two things that I have circled and get the other clutter out of the way. So here's our f of x. And here's our f prime of x. So can we do something with this to get this? Just take the derivative, right? Isn't that our kind of our shortcut, term by term? So we can do it in the closed version. Now, the only other thing that we would probably have to justify is why did this one start at 0 and this one starts at 1? Can start at zero. You're exactly right. I was wondering if somebody was going to say that. You can start this one at zero, right? If you want to, because if n were zero, you'd have zero times c sub zero x minus a to the negative first. I don't know that we want to get into x minus a to the negative first, but it really doesn't matter because it's zero anyway, right? So zero, in a sense, generates the first term, but the first term that actually is non-zero starts when n is 1. So that's another, I guess that's a good way of thinking of it. You could start it at 0. That doesn't generate any terms at all. It generates 0, which is the derivative of our constant term from f of x. If you want to start it with the actual terms that actually get generated, we can start in at 1. Another way to justify it is don't we lose a term, right? Because our first term was constant, we're going to have seemingly one fewer term. The derivative of that constant is 0, so it doesn't show up. So you really do, in a sense, have the choice of starting at n equals 0, but the first term you really want to generate that's non-zero starts when n equals 1. So if you took our, just our regular power rule or exponent rule, You take the exponent times the coefficient that's already there times the same thing to one degree less. That's exactly what this is. And we got this by looking at the term by term pattern that was there. So it's, it's valid. So you can take the derivative in its closed form. Uh, let's go to the integral. So what we want to do is integrate the function. We can do a term-by-term -term integration. Why don't we take the other path this time, since we took the term-by-term -term path the first time. What would it look like if we integrated? So if we started right here, and now we want to integrate not term by term, but just this thing right here, what would it look like? n plus 1 times c. We'll see the n plus 1. c sub n, we bring that coefficient along for the ride. Don't we do that in dif differentiation and integration? We'd have x minus a to, instead of to the n, we'd have it to the, we're integrating now, n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. Does that work? Should. We, we can check it with a couple of them. And we would want to start in at 0. Yes, because we'd want to, that c sub 0 term, when we integrate it, we want it to be there. And in fact, it will now be more than 
just C sub 0. So when n is 0, what do we get? C sub 0, x minus a to the first, all over 0 plus 1, which is 1. Is that the first term? Should be. Don't necessarily agree with that. We might ought to spend a, a few seconds on that, but let's go on to see what the next term, see if it's kind of getting us what we want. When n is 1, what do we get? C sub 1, x minus a to the 2 over 2. Let's write out what f of x was. It was c sub 0 plus c sub 1, x minus a, c sub 2. So if we integrated that guy right there, do we get this? That's got a little bit of a, I mean, it, it works. If you integrated c sub 0 with respect to x, wouldn't you just really get c sub 0 x? Right? But we've got c sub 0 x minus a. Is that OK? Well, there's the c sub 0 x. We've got a little extra baggage. c sub 0 times minus a. What is that? A That's a constant. And aren't we integrating and gonna, when we're done, we're going to have to put a big old plus c at the end of this thing anyway? Isn't that part of the plus c? It's kind of absorbed. The nice thing about that is that we do end up with powers of x minus a all the way down the line. So that one is a little tricky to get by. The rest of them, I think, are pretty easy. c sub 1, x minus a to the 2 over 2. That's what we've got here. n equals 2, c sub 2, x minus a to the 3rd over 3. So it does, in fact, give us what we want. It gives us a little extra here. Let's put a k value in front of that so that there is the possibility of some arbitrary constant any time we do an indefinite integral. How are we going to know what that is? Or how might we find k in one problem or another? How do we typically find a c or a k in an, in an integral problem? They have to give us something extra. What's typical of the extra? F, right, a point. F of 0 equals 5. Plug in 0 for x, and it's supposed to kick out 5. Something like that. So we'd have to have some additional information to find k. But we will do problems for which we will find this k value, and we'll be able to decide what the actual solution is and know what the k value is for that particular problem. So you can differentiate power series by di basically differentiating the argument. You can integrate power series by integrating the argument of the power series in the sigma no notation. Uh, we can start this. I don't know if we'll finish it. So we want to express that as a power series. Is that function, and if we get this far, we can stop and we'll pick up from this point tomorrow. Is this function in any way, shape, or form related to the one that we started class with today and did several examples yeah. modeled after this. Can't you just uh, square it? Okay, it's the whole thing squared. 
keep in mind what we just finished doing, differentiating and integrating power series. What's the derivative of that? What's the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x? Well, that's the same thing as that, right? What's the derivative of 1 minus x to the negative first? Negative 1. 1 minus x to the negative second times the derivative of what's inside? Hey, how about that? It's 1 over 1 minus x squared, and that's what we want. So is the one that is given to us in some way, shape, or form related to, related to in this case meaning, is it the derivative of or is it the integral of something that we've already done kind of in a basic case? Yes. This one right here is, in fact, the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x, well, if we want a power series for this guy, and we already have a power series for this guy, what do we do to it? Take the derivative of it. Okay? That actually is a pretty good place to stop. So we can pick up with how we go about doing that tomorrow.